All right, back from break. Uh, let's take, um, let's pick up where we left off. We were talking about musical instruments. Uh, I want to go back a few slides. Uh, there was a slide where we showed uh, a series of frequencies that um, that we would find on a, a standard piano, uh, and I realized it might be kind of useful uh, to demonstrate some of these different frequencies. So, um, so I got out a piano. So uh, I do have a piano here, and uh, let's take a listen. Uh, we talked about the structure of these different frequencies. Let's see, what had we decided? Oh yeah, it's a well-tempered scale, and each frequency is larger by a factor of 2 to the 1 12th from the frequency before it. And uh, a couple different examples here. The textbook's example was, let's see, uh, starting at uh, middle C, that's 220, uh, 262, 277. So when it's the same ratio of frequencies from one note to the next, it, it creates, you know, subjectively you experience that as, as sort of being evenly spaced. So, uh, or else we've trained ourselves with that, with the music that we've developed. So in any case, that's what that scale sounded like. Now we talked about octaves, so let's, so there is C, that's twice the frequency, that's another doubling, another doubling, another doubling. We can take C's in the other direction, that's half the frequency, half as much. So these are all doublings of frequencies, and so they're all referred to as being the same note but at different octaves. All right, so that's what a series of frequency doublings sound like, just for comparison. If I go to the scale, chromatic scale, leaving all of the half steps in, there is 440, the official 440A. Now, the reason they're called octaves uh, is that when we play music, more often than not, we don't use all the different pitches. So, uh, if I'm doing, let me go back, uh, a C, what's called a C major scale. So, a, a C major scale says, let's just bring in notes that uh, sound good together, they, sound, they, they create a certain effect. So I leave out some of the half steps, and for C, it's easy uh, to show which ones. So I'm going to be leaving out uh, the C sharps, the D sharp, all of the uh, sharps or flats get left out on the C scale. And so... So that may sound more familiar, right? But notice that those pitches aren't evenly spaced because we're skipping uh, some of the uh, intermediate pitches along the way. All right, and or you could even do, uh, instead of a C scale, you could do what's called a C major chord and pick out just the pitches that are considered to be the dominant uh, pitches that give that scale its, um, its, its particular sound. In fact, I'm going to guess if I do this, you already have in your head that because you, you've heard that so many times. That's a major chord. All right, so we got the piano out here. Let's take a look and see what uh, problems they are going to throw us. This was a review of standing waves. Here is a picture of a guitar playing a guitar by shortening the strings. So here's, a, here's an example. Um, what we've got here are... Um, it's a violin. We have a string that's 32 centimeters in length. And look, it is tuned to play A above middle C. It's tuned to play, play that perfect 440 hertz pitch. So uh, 
what would be the wavelength of the string that's vibrating? So, and then the next question is, what would be the wavelength of the sound in the air as it travels from the string over to my ear? So let's take a look and see. Uh, so here is the, the violin string. It had a length of 32, it's a frequency of 440, and for a violin string, the dominant harmonic is going to be the first harmonic. So we're going to set N equal to 1. Now, the wave speed for this, um, we can calculate what the wave speed needs to be by taking frequency times wavelength. So they've told us the length is 32, it's the first harmonic, that means the wavelength is 64 centimeters. I can take the frequency and the uh, wavelength and use those to determine what the wave speed is. And it turns out the wave speed on this string right now is 282 meters per second. All right, so we've determined what the wave speed must be when this is properly tuned. Now, uh, the wavelength is at 64 centimeters, the wave speed's at 282. Now, let's take a look at that very same, uh, let's take a look at the sound that travels through the air uh, in order, you know, we can hear the sound because it's propagated through air. Now, because the string is oscillating back and forth 440 times a second, it's going to create the very same frequency in the air. Whatever frequency this musical instrument is oscillating at, that's the frequency of oscillations that are going to travel through the air. The frequencies match. Now, the wavelengths don't need to. Uh, the wavelength, we don't hear wavelengths. We hear frequencies. And so what is really important is as that sound passes by our ear, what is the frequency of oscillations that are taking place? The, the ear's not measuring out the wavelengths uh, of the sound coming in. Now, in air, the wave speed is different. So the wave speed on the uh, violin, this was a violin string, is 282. The wave speed in the air is 343. Since the wave speed is different, the wavelength will be different. So the wavelength in the air is 0.78 meters. And that says, <clears throat> you know, when you hit that 440 pitch and it's propagating through the air, from one compression to the next, there will be a distance of 78 centimeters. Okay, sorry, 78 centimeters. So there's that much distance from one compression to the next, and that pattern is traveling 343 meters per second. So here's some pictures of some musical instruments. Here's a piano with all those strings in there. They've all been individually tuned. Uh, here's a guitar. With, with a bunch of strings that have all been tuned. Uh, this slide is just talking about uh, the transmission of the sound. So it's one thing to get this string vibrating, but both of these instruments have these boxes that have been built around the strings to create a region where the energy can be amplified. So uh, that, the idea is to make an effective transmission of the energy to the surrounding air. If the surrounding air doesn't pick up the um, oscillations, you're not going to hear it. The string can be vibrating back and forth with, you know, all the energy on the planet. That's an exaggeration. But the string can be moving back and forth with a lot of energy. Uh, you're not going to hear it unless that energy is, is uh, transmitted through the air. So we have these boxes that we put around the strings uh, to help couple that uh, string vibration to vibrations in the air. All right, here, it, here are a couple of wood in, uh, woodwind instruments, wind instruments. Uh, wind instruments work a little differently. Uh, wind instruments, they clearly don't have a string that's vibrating. Now, <clears throat> they do set up standing waves. So what happens within uh, a wind instrument, and I'm, I'm going to refer to these as tubes, so a wind instrument, typically, it's, it's just a long tube, and, uh, ooh, look, I brought along 
and uh, a wind instrument also. I brought along a brass instrument. Uh, this is just a tube. It's a trombone, but it's a tube, and I can get a you know a measuring tape out, and I can measure this tube, and uh, it's just going to have a certain length to it. So. Uh, What we have then is a tube. Now, the trombone, for example, it's open at one end. That's where the mouthpiece is. And that's actually where, if you're playing the trombone, that's where you're driving the vibrations of air. That's where you're setting up the standing waves within the instrument. So the similarity between you know, the tube instruments and the string instruments, similarity between the trombone and, and the piano, is they're both based on a standing wave uh, setup. On the uh, piano, on a string instrument, the standing wave is coming from a vibrating string. Uh, in the trombone, the standing wave is a series. Do they have any good pictures? They don't. I thought there was one. Well, it's those pictures we've looked at before. So we've looked at those pictures before where they show. Let's look at pressure variation. So what we have is we've got a compression in the middle and uh, no compressions at the nodes. Um, so again, in terms of pressure variation, I've got a, a, a compression in the middle for the first harmonic, two compressions, two anti-nodes for the second harmonic and three and so on. It turns out that the mathematics, when we go in and we come up with formulas when we develop formulas for wavelength, wave speed, and frequency, it all works the same way. The pattern of wavelengths is still going to be set up for a tube open at both ends. Uh, the pattern of wavelengths we end up with is still going to follow the pattern of 2L divided by N, where N is an integer number. Now, tubes, there's, there, there's, a, there's a complication with tubes that we have to talk about. Tubes can actually be closed at one end. So what you can do is you can drive the tube at one end, uh, you can close this end, uh, and you can still get the standing wave set up. Think of having a drinking glass and putting different levels of water in there, and then blowing over, or bottles, blowing over the top of a bottle and getting uh, a particular frequency to be ampli amplified. So uh, that's setting up, uh, on, with just one end open, we can set up standing waves. Now the patterns are different here. Uh, when we close one end, the, the, har the first harmonic is coming from a wavelength that's twice as long. If you look at the wave pattern here, or with the pressure variations, if you look at the pressure variations that are taking place here, um, the first harmonic, the first wavelength, is four lengths of the tube. So, uh, and then, <clears throat> if this is the first harmonic, this wave pattern is actually going to give us three, uh, one-third of the wavelength, and here the wavelength is one-fifth. So, the, the pattern of frequencies is not one, two, three, four, multiplications, it's one, three, five, seven. Only the odd harmonics will show up. So the, the, the fundamental will be, uh, the frequency will be half as large as the open, open tube, uh, and then only the odd harmonics will show up. So that makes a difference. Here's an example. Here are some organ pipes. Let's take a look. So here's the comparison. Uh, the open, open tube open at both ends, and it's being driven from one end, and then the other end is open to the air. So if you're playing a trombone, uh, this is an open, open tube. Uh, when you play it, you create, you create a disturbance, right? So you create a disturbance at one end. You're, you've got your lips vibrating back and forth at one end. And what you do is you just, you just blow air through your lips, and then you tighten them. And the more you tighten the lips, the higher frequency your lip vibrates at. And that's it. That's how you drive a particular frequency on... This is just a tube, right? Just a, a tube instrument. So uh, this is open, open. 
Now, if I closed one end, uh, then I could still set something up maybe by blowing over the edge of this. I'm, I'm not sure um, exactly how that would work. But the open opens, the wavelengths are 2L over N, the open closed, which are called closed, are 4L over N. Uh, the N for the open open tube, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, the uh, ends for the open closed to one three five seven only the odd harmonics. Uh, the frequencies are still determined by wave speed over wavelength. Uh, the frequency of the nth harmonic is still n times f one. But remember, here we only have the odd harmonics. All right. Um, now, what's the wave speed for these wind instruments? and it's the speed of sound in air. So we're generating, uh, we're generating these patterns of compression and expansion, or rarefaction, compression and rarefaction, inside these tubes. And uh, those are standing waves uh, that correspond to a wave speed of 343 meters per second. So here, here's the problem. They said, uh, let's look at some organ pipes. One is open, open. One is open, closed. They're both 26 centimeters in length. What frequencies will we get? Well, the wavelengths are going to be, for the first harmonic, the wavelength will be uh, 2L, which is 52 centimeters. Uh, a wavelength of 52 centimeters, I convert that to meters. Um, the wave speed is 343. And what we end up with is a, oh look, the frequency is 660. So it's uh, 660, that's an E, is that what that is? Um, maybe? So um, that's 660 hertz. And then the next harmonic would be an E an octave above. Uh, the next one, this is not an octave because it's not, not doubling. This would be an octave above, this would be the next octave. That would be some intermediate value. So 660, 1320, uh, 1980, 2640, the frequencies are going to be 1, 2, 3, 4 ratio. Now, for the open closed, that's 26. The wavelength, the wave speed's the same. It's still the sound, speed of sound. Uh, the wavelength is going to be four times the length, 104 centimeters. And that means that it can hit a low frequency of 330, which is half, half amount. So, this is that higher, I hope I'm getting this right. This is the 660, and that's the 330. It's an octave lower. Uh, it's a factor of two. Now here, I'm not getting any octaves because none of these odd numbers are multiples of each other. Okay, so uh, what I'm getting is three times. This is like 990, 16, 990. Yeah, 1650, right, uh, 2310. So I'm getting a pattern of frequencies, but notice how it goes back and forth. If I set these two organ pipes right next to each other, the different harmonics, there, there are no duplicates. They kind of go back and forth uh, between the frequencies we can produce with those. All right, here's the problem. It's a flute. Uh, the flute is designated to play Middle C, 262 hertz, as a fundamental when all uh, the holes on the flute are covered. Uh, what should be the distance from the mouthpiece to the end of the flute? Uh, this is only an approximation since the antinode does not occur precisely at the mouthpiece. So, uh, some of these length calculations that we're working with on the woodwinds uh, are a bit of an approximation. Uh, the strings are pretty reliable. Uh, the woodwinds are a little different as to exact placement of the anti-nodes and the nodes. So, um, so anyway, this is a flute. We're in the first harmonic. This is the frequency. This is the wave speed. And the wavelength for that would be 1.31 meters. Now, that's the wavelength within the instrument. That's the distance between the compressions that are set up inside the flute. Now, uh, <clears throat> the, the length 
then of the flute needs to be one half wavelength. Uh, and so that would say that the, the length of the flute from the, the mouthpiece out to the end of the flute should be 65.5 centimeters. So if you play the flute, you know, go home, measure it, see if it's anything close to this. Uh, and it sounds like when you're playing the, the, the middle C, that's probably one of the low notes on a flute, right? Uh, everything is covered. That's the longest wavelength you can get. That's probably going to be giving you the lowest pitch. Okay. And, uh, you know, flutes and clarinets and saxophones, they're complicated because they have so many different valves, uh, all the different lengths that you're controlling. Uh, I, I kind of like the trombone because... Well, it's got variable length. Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll see more examples of that, or we'll, we'll try a few things out here. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at tube harmonics. So uh, this is actually, this shows the harmonics that you're able to play uh, on, a, on a trombone. This is an example of the harmonics. Now I have to tune this. Okay, I think that's... And just in case any of you guys have got your, uh, your phones out with your uh, tuning applications to see if I'm really in tune, um, I think that's where I usually tune. Uh, the trombone has a length to it. Uh, the wave speed is going to be 343. The wave, um, let's see. The trombone is designed, now this is not quite true. Uh, the, the first position, the, the standard length of the trombone, <laughs> actually a B flat. Uh, the A comes from lengthening just a bit. Uh, I like I, I would like to go through and, and kind of explain all this in terms of A. Uh, and that's the reason is because A is our, our pitch reference. We pitch to an, a 440 Hertz A. So let's work backwards. There is a 440 Hertz A there is a 220 hertz A, there is a 110, and then there's a 55. Now, trombone's designed so that this is the first harmonic. So, uh, when I'm in second position, but... So, that's not it. When you learn to play the trombone, they actually don't tell you about the first harmonic. Uh, you may learn about this later on if you're playing the trombone a lot, and at some point they go, someone tells you, you know, you can actually hit an octave lower than that. Uh, so when you're playing the trombone, they really use, they use these harmonics, two, three, four, five, but they tend not to use one, but you, you can find it. Let's see if we can do that. So here is harmonic two. So it's, it's a little bit difficult to sustain, at least for me, but uh, that's an octave lower. That would be the 55 hertz. second harmonic, three, four, five, six. It's been a while. Let me try again. That was the seven. Eight, so uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now notice, we talked a little bit about these higher harmonics. On a guitar string, when you hit it, you just got whatever harmonics you've got. But on a woodwind, using the very same length, you're expected to be able to produce these eight different harmonics. How do you do it? And you tighten your lips so that the lips will vibrate uh, at that frequency. So you're actually, when you're learning to play a brass instrument like this, you're learning that how to tighten your lips to hit every note, or you should be, you know, ideally. Uh, so you've got to be able to vibrate your lips at these different frequencies or close to those frequencies in order to sustain that standing wave at that frequency inside the tube. So uh, now, what can you do with a, a tube that's one length? You can play.
play songs as long as they only have a few notes. Now, for a trombone, we want to be able to fill in all of these intermediate notes. And what that requires, it turns out, going back to... Um, ooh, that's a ways back, too. Wow. Going back to this, how do I fill in all the other notes? Because I can only hit a few of these uh, at one length. Well, you just learn to use seven different lengths. So... So by the time you've adjusted to seven different lengths, again, ideally, uh, you are able to hit all of these different pitches. So you're able to fill in all the intermediate pitches, you're able to hit all of those half steps. Okay, um, so that's how playing a woodwind or brass instrument uh, works. Let's see where we have gotten ourselves to. All right, I think we got past the flute, we got past the um, tube harmonics. Uh, now we're going to go back and take a look at superposition. Again, we saw this in chapter 15. Uh, we said that it's the very same diagram, isn't it? So here is frequency one. Maybe that's the first harmonic. Here is frequency two. And frequency 3, so they're multiples of each other, these harmonics. And that's the sum of all three. And it has kind of a different pattern to it. It has a different shape to it. Now, remember with these tube instruments, or with the string instruments, you could actually be setting up more than one of these harmonics at the same time. So you might say, here I am playing the guitar. I hit this guitar string. Uh, what pitch am I playing? And it's not just one pitch. So let's see what you have. Uh, here's a piano, here's a violin. So here's a couple of string instruments. And uh, what they're showing is, uh, <clears throat> for the piano, I'm getting a lot of the first harmonic, but then I'm getting uh, a fair amount of the second and the third. And I don't know exactly what the pattern of all these are. It looks like uh, some of the harmonics are being suppressed, but other harmonics are showing up. And so, if you just play one pure pitch, it sounds like a tuning fork. And um, it turns out that tuning fork music isn't very popular. Uh, the musical instruments that we use, for whatever reason, again, is it something built into the way that our, our brains process hearing, or is it just something we've gotten used to? I know when I was a kid, electronic music uh, was being presented as maybe the music of the future, and rather than having all these overtones, you would just have these pure pitches. It, it never really caught on. It's, it's like a tuning, an, uh, an orchestra made out of tuning forks. Uh, so instruments that we, that we do use tend to have uh, some combination of different frequencies going on. Even when you say, I'm hitting this pitch, you're really hitting this, and maybe a little bit of that, and this, and so it's, it's a combination of frequencies that, um, that show up. All right, let's look at some other features of sound. Um, I hope the musical instrument stuff is useful. I know a lot of people end up, uh, in some, some cases, traumatically learning how to play a musical instrument, but it is kind of fun. I know when I first, uh, again, my freshman year in college, when I took physics, and started learning about how some of these musical instruments work, it was, it was astounding, I thought. Um, so anyway, let's, let's look at uh, superposition of sound, and in particular, interference effects. So how do we get interference effects uh, within sound? Well, we could have two speakers. Let's say we have speaker A and speaker B, and they're producing identical frequencies. So the identical frequency is coming out, that means that there are going, and this is really clever. They, they label this speaker A and this speaker B, 
and point C is where there is constructive interference taking place, and point D is where there is destructive interference taking place. So the constructive interference happens when one of the compressions overlaps with the other compression, and you get a super compression. It's extra compressed here, and that means that it's louder. You're hearing the effects of both speakers combined. But if I'm just off to the side here, where I'm halfway between the two compressions, I'm at a rarefaction. And so if this is at a rarefaction, if it's at a compression from speaker B, but if it's at a rarefaction from speaker A, those two effects will cancel out. Point D, the sound is going, and they're showing it here, at point D, the sound will drop to nothing. Uh, assuming the speakers are identical and we've, we've measured everything out carefully. So that's an interference effect uh, in terms of spatial interference. Now there's also what's called temporal interference, and that is, what if I've got two different pitches, you know, what if I'm playing in the band and uh, the two trumpet players, not the trombones, but the two trumpet players, what if they're out of pitch with each other? So, uh, oh, these are some low frequencies, though. Now, maybe this, maybe this is like the tuba. So I've got one tuba playing at 50 hertz, and I've got another tuba playing at 60 hertz. They're not in tune with each other. And for any of you who were, you know, you took band or whatever in high school, uh, or elementary or middle school or whatever, uh, you know that the, you know, the band director at that point says, all right, you two, play your instruments and let's see if we can tune. And what they're listening for are beats, what they call beats. Now it turns out when you take two different frequencies that are really similar, but they're not quite the same, what you end up with is there are going to be times at which the two frequencies reinforce each other constructive interference, but later on there is going to be a time where they're out of phase with each other and that's destructive. And then we gradually work back to fully constructive and then things come apart again and we're back to fully destructive. And that just happens because you've got two different frequencies. Now what we can demonstrate both demonstratingly and also through the mathematics is that uh, what that does is as we get more and more destructive effect, the amplitudes drop off. So what we end up hearing is a frequency halfway in between with a rising and falling amplitude. So the sound goes, it goes the, the loudness increases and falls. If the difference between the pitches is not too large, we can actually hear the beats. So in this case, the difference in the pitches would be 10 hertz. That would produce a beat frequency of 10 hertz, and that's, that's a pretty high frequency to pick out. So you're hoping the instruments are better tuned uh, to start with than this. And so here's the formula. I mean, we're not going to go through it. It's another one of those, um, well, it's the very same formula we looked at before, only this time both waves are going in the same direction, but the frequencies are a little different. So the frequencies of the wave numbers don't match up. Or, or actually, this is done in terms of a standing wave. Uh, in any case, what we've got is... Um, yeah, that is interesting. Okay. Yeah, this is in terms of the frequencies only. So we're standing at one place, we're letting these two waves go by, and we're listening to what the frequencies are going to be, so we're at a fixed location. And we've added those two oscillations together, and this is what we get. We get something with a, a maximum amplitude of 2A, but then over time, this oscillates, uh, and that's, it oscillates with a frequency that's the difference multiplied by an oscillation that is the average frequency. Okay. Ooh, I did do this. All right, so... Here are the two waves being added together. Notice that this time the frequency is different and the wave number is different. So we can uh, add these two using the same formula as before. Now what we're going to do is we're going to be observers and 
we as observers are going to be located at one location. We might as well call that x equals zero. So if x is equal to zero, that drops out, that drops out, and uh, the, the minus signs, we'll just reverse them. Um, we'll, we'll change the phase by a half cycle. Uh, the effect that we're going to get when we add these two together is this. Okay. <coughs> so it's going to be the sum of the frequencies divided by two. That's the average. And then the difference of the frequencies divided by two. And that means that we're going to oscillate with a frequency. The envelope is going to have what's called a beat frequency. The loudness rises and falls, and that rising and falling will happen at the frequency of F1 minus F2. Here it is, beats. Uh, we got a tuning fork that produces a steady 400 hertz tone. Uh, this is, so we're going to tune the guitar string. So I got a tuning fork out, ready to tune the guitar string. This is the tuning fork. When the person hits the guitar string, what they find is that there are beats happening, and those beats are happening at 4 hertz. Now, the fact that the beats happen at 4 hertz doesn't tell us if the guitar string is pitched higher or lower. So we just have to adjust back and forth. And again, if you took high school band or something, uh, you're probably familiar with this, right? Uh, you and the other player, the, the trumpet players or whatever, you start adjusting your tuning uh, slide uh, until the pitches match, until the beats go away. And when the beats go away, that lets you know the pitches match. So if I'm hearing a beat frequency of 4, uh, my pitch might be 404, it might be 396, I adjust back and forth until the beats go away. When the beats go away, I know I'm at the same pitch as the tuning fork. Tuning forks are always right. Um, let's talk a bit about the Doppler effect. This is another important uh, topic that we're going to be looking at. Uh, the Doppler effect says that when a sound is being produced, we have a source of the sound, we have an observer. If the source of the sound is at rest with respect to the medium, now in this case the medium is the air, if it's sound that we're thinking about. So I've got a fire truck that's parked, and there's a person at rest standing there, and uh, whatever frequency the sound is being produced at, that's the frequency at which the wave fronts pass over the person. So the person hears the frequency the same as what was produced by the source. Now what happens though if the fire truck is moving and here's the siren going on? Well if the fire truck is moving, what happens is it's not waiting for the wave fronts to move on and then generate a new wave front. It generates a wave front but then it moves forward and generates another wave front. So it's not giving as much time for the wave fronts to propagate away from the fire engine. As a result, you get wave fronts that are bunched together in front. So now, if I have a person standing here and the fire truck is approaching, they will hear a higher frequency. Now notice, this doesn't have to do with how far away the person is or how close the person is. It has to do with whether the source of the sound is moving. As long as that fire truck continues to move, it's going to have this, uh, these wave fronts that are closely packed in front, and that's going to create a higher frequency. Those are going to pass by the person's ear at a faster rate. Now, behind the fire truck, the wave fronts will be spread out more, that will be a lower frequency, right? So if the siren is at, you know, 600 hertz, then maybe when the, when the fire truck is moving, that goes up to 650. And then behind them, maybe it drops to 560. So there's going to be a reduction in frequency behind and an increase in front. This is what we refer to as a Doppler effect. Now, all the speeds have to be measured compared with the medium. Now, we also get, I, let me go back, we also get a Doppler effect not just if the source is in motion, 
But what if this person, what if the truck's at rest, but this person is driving along towards the truck, towards the fire truck, and the fire truck has the siren going, but the, the, the fire truck has stopped. Well, if I'm driving along towards the fire truck, that also will produce a higher frequency. I'll hear a higher frequency. Because for the observer, they're not waiting for the wave fronts to reach them. They're listening to one wave front, and then the next one goes by in the next. And since they're moving towards the source, those wave fronts are coming at a higher frequency. So they will experience a higher pitch. So we could have the observer in motion, the source in motion, or both. Now, there's one super Doppler formula. There it is. Uh, the, the upside of this is there's just the one formula. The downside is you have to remember how to use the plus or minus signs. They're all listed as plus or minus. Now, a plus sign in the numerator means that the frequency has been shifted higher. And that means that uh, the observer is moving towards the source. It's a minus sign if the observer is moving away from the source. Now, the denominator is keeping track of the speed of the source. A plus sign here actually gives us a higher frequency. So the plus sign means that the source is moving towards the observer. And the plus sign means the uh, source is moving away. Now, you, you just have to practice this. So with a little practice, running through the problems a few times and seeing what the possibilities are, um, and hoping you'll pretty quickly learn uh, which signs to use in which case. Now, the VSND, that's the speed of sound. So this is the speed of sound, this is the speed of sound. Uh, we don't have to have both the observer and the source moving. It could be one of these is zero. So uh, if the observer is moving towards the source, um, you'll hear a higher frequency. So, so this works out great. You know, if you've gone to the symphony and you've got some of those seats way up at the top, because the ones down close are really expensive, uh, and you're listening to the symphony and you're saying, yeah, they sound good, but I wish they would have pitched a little higher. Maybe they could have tuned a little higher uh, for this evening. You know how to solve that? You make your way out to the aisle, say, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. You get out to the aisle, and then you run to the stage. Now, as long as you're moving towards the source, you will hear a higher pitch. So, you know, you run out to the aisle, you start running towards the stage, and you go, yes, that was the sound I was looking for. I like that uh, tune just a little sharper, just a little higher frequency is nice. Now, the downside, of course, is by the time you reach the stage, you can't keep running towards it, it. It only lasts for a short period of time. Um, and, and, and then you're standing at the stage and people around are wondering why you ran down there. Um, and you have to explain to them about the higher pitch and anyway. Uh, but that's, you know, that's how Doppler effects work. So let's try this. Uh, <clears throat> a siren of a police car at rest has a siren that has a frequency of 1600 hertz. What's the frequency you will hear if you are at rest and the police car is moving 25 meters per second towards you and then away from you? So this is how it works, right? You're standing at the side of the street. You hear this siren. You turn, and here is this police car coming down the street. It's got its siren wailing, and there's a certain pitch that you hear. Now, the pitch you hear has been Doppler shifted higher. So that's actually higher than the pitch of the siren if it was just sitting there at rest. And then when it passes you, that's going to go lower uh, afterwards. So let's look at both cases. So in this example, you are the observer and you're not moving. So V0 is equal to zero. That just goes away in my super Doppler formula. Now, the starting frequency is 1600. And uh, the speed of sound is 343. That goes in these two places. And uh, the speed of the uh, police car is the source, and that's at 25 meters per second. So I'm just putting the numbers in. So when it's moving towards us, I want to get a higher frequency. And that means I want to use the minus sign. The minus sign will give me the higher frequency. So I've used the minus sign, subtracted off the 25 meters per second, 
and that gives me a frequency of 1726. So as long as the police car is coming towards me, uh, I'm going to hear a pitch of 1726 hertz. Now the police car passes me, and now what I have to do is say, if the police car is moving away from me, I will hear a lower frequency. How do I, which sign should I pick? And for the lower frequency, I want the denominator to be bigger. Uh, so I'm going to use the plus sign. So this time I'll use the plus. I'll take the 343, add on the 25. You know, the top, that's zero. And this is 343. So here we are adding 25 meters per second on. And that results in a lowered uh, Doppler effect. And now I'm hearing a pitch of 1491. So it's... Mm -hmm right? Uh, that Doppler effect as the police car goes by. Now, what would happen if we had two Doppler shifts? What if we set out some sound and we listened for the, the sound that reflects back? And this is actually how uh, ultrasounds work. So, uh, you guys, I'm guessing, are familiar with um, medical imaging using ultrasound. What they're doing in this example is they're using a 5,000 hertz uh, sound, and uh, that's a machine that they bring into the room, and they put the ultrasound on. Um, so, um, and then what that ultrasound will do is it will generate this high frequency disturbance that propagates through. Uh, the tissue, and then wherever there's a boundary, you'll get some kind of a reflection. So you can actually get some reasonably good uh, resolution with these. Uh, let's see. But what's going to happen is uh, the source originally is at rest. The source here is at rest. And the observer is moving. So this is a Doppler uh, ultrasound. So a Doppler ultrasound can actually measure the speed of like a heart. So you could do a beating heart, hearts moving back and forth, and you can do speed measurements of the front of a heart moving back and forth. So let's say that the object here is the heart and we're doing an echocardiogram uh, and um, it happens to be moving, the front surface of the heart happens to be moving towards the instrument at 3.50 meters per second well, that will create a Doppler effect due to the motion of the observer. And then the sound reflects. And when the sound reflects, then the heart becomes the source of the sound, and that will produce another Doppler effect. So let's see, let's set that up and see what it looks like. So first of all, we're starting with an initial frequency. I'm going to call that 5,000 hertz. We're going to send that out. Now, the front of the heart is coming towards the sound, and that means that the uh, observer <clears throat> is moving towards the source. I'm going to use plus, and then they say that the heart is moving at 3.50 meters per second. That gives me 50.51, uh, 5,051 hertz. So I can see it's not much of a Doppler shift, but it's measurable, it turns out. Now, on the way back, the heart is going to be the source and the uh, instrument will be the detector, the observer. And so here I put a zero on top, and I put a minus sign, because I, I know there's going to be a Doppler shift towards higher frequency. And so what was uh, 5051 on the way back is Doppler shifted to 5103. Now the Doppler shift instruments themselves, uh, they tend they're, they're not measuring these exact frequencies, they're actually measuring a beat frequency. So the instruments are designed so that they can compare the frequency that was sent out with the frequency that can, comes back. So they sent out something roughly 5,000, and what came back is about 5,100. They'll be able to measure a beat frequency of 100. All right. So uh, anyway, that's two Doppler shifts, and this is kind of the basis for uh, Doppler ultrasounds. Okay, uh, <clears throat> what happens if you go faster than sound? So going faster than sound, uh, here's an object at rest sending out these nice evenly spaced 
wave fronts. If the object is moving, here is the Doppler shift ahead of the object, and here is the Doppler shift behind. The Doppler shift in front is a higher frequency, shorter wavelength. Doppler shift behind is lower frequency, longer wavelength. Now, this is getting pretty close to the speed of sound. In fact, right at the speed of sound, notice that the sound doesn't move away. I, if I'm moving at the speed of sound relative to the air, and whatever disturbance I'm creating is propagating through the air at the speed of sound, the sound doesn't get out ahead of me. So people out in front, somebody standing here, they can't hear that yet. Uh, there's no sound that's reached them. The sound's traveling at a finite speed. So you've got this supersonic plane coming in. And you look up and you see the supersonic plane go by. You can't hear it yet. Uh, now, if you go faster than sound, which I guess is supersonic, then you generate a shock wave that's made out of these individual wave fronts. Now, in this case, the supersonic object, maybe it's a supersonic jet, uh, gets out ahead of the sound. So it's actually ahead of where the sound is located. The sound can't keep up. Now here's a, a, a nice picture of a water wave set up. You can see what the shock waves look like. Uh, the uh, superposition between those individual wave fronts uh, creates a, a turbulence, uh, and that, that's the shock wave. Okay, and here's the example with the supersonic plane. So uh, it says here that the nose is creating a shock wave, the back of the plane is creating a shock wave, uh, and so you're getting these disturbances that are uh, in the shape of a cone. So the person at sea hasn't heard anything yet. All of the sound produced by this plane is still within this cone. Now, the shock waves are going to travel at the speed of sound, and that means eventually uh, the person at C will hear this shock wave. The person at B is just experiencing the shock wave. It was really silent, like, wow, that's a very stealthy plane. And then at some point, the shock wave hits. Person at A, the shock waves have already passed. All right, we talked a little bit about ultrasound and medical imaging. So I think, yeah, so this is nice, I guess. Uh, here's the transducer part of an ultrasound placed up against the patient. Uh, you know, here is, here's the organs inside the body. I don't know, is that a kidney? Uh, is that a liver? Maybe. So here's the liver, here's kidney, here's a vertebrae. So what you can do is, is imaging's gotten so good that you can get uh, time delays to decide how far back you're looking. And like we said before, if these are moving, then you can also get velocity information from the, uh, from the ultrasounds. So that's kind of remarkable. So I wanted to, to wrap this up. There was a, I, I found this online, actually. This is a heart, and uh, it's an echocardiogram. Now, it's just a single photo, but with the echocardiograms, you can actually see this in real time. So uh, uh, one of my kids, uh, when he was younger, uh, they were following him up uh, with uh, echocardiograms from time to time. And I remember the first time he went in for one of his echocardiograms, uh, there was just a blob on the screen. I kind of looked at that and I said, really, you can see stuff going on there? And then years later, we went back and I remember the, the, the technician put the transducer, you know, on his chest. You know, they put the little cream on there and the gel and put it on there. As soon as he touched it, on the screen, you could see all four chambers of the heart, and you could watch all the valves open and close. And I thought, that is amazing. That's just an amazing uh, imaging technique that they have developed. Now, uh, the one that I found online, for whatever reason, it has the ventricles on top, and it has the atria below. And it, it was not especially good resolution. I should have been able to find something better. I didn't. I searched for a while. This is about the best I came up with. But it's got the left and right atria and ventricles uh, identified here. And uh, I'll just stop there, I guess. It's a good place to wrap up Chapter 16. So um, if you guys have any questions, as always, uh, stop by office hours. Uh, just want to mention that 
this wraps up uh, the first 16 chapters of the course, clearly. And the first 16 chapters of the course make up what we call mechanics. So it's all about forces and energy and rotation and oscillation. And now we're going to move in. We still have uh, four weeks of the course left. And uh, during these next four weeks, we'll be looking at thermodynamics. So four more weeks, four more chapters, and those are going to be dealing with thermodynamics. It's going to have a different feel to it. Um, looking forward to those chapters.